Good morning. For those of you who may not know me, I am Mr. Oswald. I teach world civilization and United States history. I live in Eladai. I coach boys basketball and boys soccer. I am beginning my 12th year at Wayland Academy, and this is the second time I have been persuaded to speak in a Friday chapel. On that other occasion, I spoke about the historic impact of a recently deceased pope. Today, I'm going to pontificate a bit myself. One of my favorite traditions at Wayland is one of our newer traditions, the junior poetry recitation. For those of you who are new, one of the requirements of the junior year in English is a public speaking project. In their turn, each junior is to choose a short poem that he or she will recite from memory for the Wayland community at the beginning of assembly. While I suppose the juniors' feelings about this assignment range from optimism to mild distaste to paralyzing dread, I am fond of it for several reasons. I like this tradition because I firmly believe in the importance of cultivating public speaking as a skill, and I often enjoy the poems the juniors choose to share with their audience, especially on those occasions when a student finds a poem that truly captures some part of his or her personality and shares that with our community. At least twice in the last three years, someone has chosen to recite the poem that I will share with you now from a book published in 1992 by a writer named Mary Ann Williamson entitled, Our Greatest Fear. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our, light, our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. This has become a fairly well-known poem. Many of you probably heard it in the popular 2005 film, Coach Carter, which starred Samuel L. Jackson as a basketball coach who kept challenging his players, asking them, what is your deepest fear? Until one of them responded by reciting Williamson's poem. I like this poem well enough. I like the sentiment of self-affirmation and self-esteem that the poem reinforces. The students who have recited this poem here in chapel have done so successfully, and the poem has been well received by an appreciative audience in our community. I've seen people smile and nod in apparent agreement with the sentiments of the poem. And why wouldn't we agree with the sentiments of the poem? These words encourage us to believe in ourselves and to embody the potential excellence that is presence in, present in each of us. And the poem does that in a way that acknowledges that others have this present in themselves. It urges us toward an unselfish sharing of our talents. And the American historian in me can't help but point out that the author has clearly been influenced by the ideas of transcendentalism, which is usually considered the first intellectual and cultural movement to emerge in the United States. In 1841, transcendental author Ralph Waldo Emerson published his essay, Self-Reliance. I'll quote from the first pages of that essay. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. The highest merit we ascribe to Moses Plato and Milton is that they set not wet books and traditions, 
and spoke not what men, but what they thought. A man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Tomorrow, a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time. And we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. So we can see that Williamson's ideas are well established and rooted in some of the finest and most optimistic of American traditions. But the appeal of Williamson's poem actually probably comes to us quite naturally. But then when I reflect on the poem a little more, I get an unsettled feeling, a feeling that is not unlike disappointment. Why is it that we as a community and as individuals are so reluctant, so unwilling to really let our light shine? Now that's a rhetorical question, and worse, it's one for which I can offer no definitive answer. It may be, as Williamson observed, that we do not wish to make others feel insecure. Or maybe not. But for our purposes today, why is not really the important problem. For simply that we shrink, that we hide our light, is the problem. And so remembering, as Mr. Yankai noted last week, that chapel is a proposition and not an imposition of a speaker's ideas. And as the quotation from Aristotle last week put it, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I'm going to propose something to our community. But before I do, a little more background information. Having mentioned Aristotle, the world civ teacher in me can't help himself. The ancient Greeks, and in particular the Athenians, have furnished world history with some of its most influential political philosophy, including the works of Aristotle. We get our very word politics from Aristotle. And following two weeks of conventions, I'm not sure we're that grateful. <laughs> Who believed that humans were unique in their capacity? Aristotle believed that humans were unique in their capacity for speech and rational thought, and were so equipped to live in a city, or polis as he would have known it, because they possessed these talents, reason, and speech. In his greatest work of political philosophy, aptly called The Politics, Aristotle famously claimed that man is by nature a political animal, and that a man who is no part of a city is either a beast or a god. Now for Aristotle and his contemporaries among the ancient Greek political philosophers, the central concern of their pondering, their examination of the world in which they lived, was the cultivation of virtue within their polis, within their city. And though they evidently disagreed about how best to achieve this, they accepted the underlying assumption that the best city was the city that nourished the best citizens, and that the best citizens were those who were most concerned with the good of their city. For what was good for the city was good for its citizens. There is a circularity to this argument. It's like a definition defining itself. But to the ancient Greek philosophers, there was an unavoidable connection between the virtuous city and the virtuous citizen. And while Aristotle would not have been entirely comfortable if he had encountered the sheer self-confidence of Emerson's self-reliant man, Aristotle was still an Athenian who would admire excellence in all things and in the ability of excellent, of the excellent, to inspire excellence in others. So at last I come to my proposal to you, the Wayland community. I propose that we here at Wayland, a small and close-knit community, 
We are like an ancient polis. When we rise to be the best that we can be in all the things that we do, including our activities, our schoolwork, and perhaps most importantly, in how we treat one another in our community. When we do not shrink from our opportunities to shine, that we will have the best community that we can have. May we challenge ourselves to be the community whose members grow and improve, and to be a community that praises the excellence amongst us. That way, no one here will ever be afraid to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, or fabulous, just because it might make us insecure. Show those around us how deeply we want them to succeed. Do not allow yourself to be less so that no one around you will allow himself or herself to be less. And be a community that buries our selfishness instead of our strength, that buries our selfishness instead of hiding our light. Please remember and consider the ideas of Ralph Waldo Emerson, of Marianne Williamson, of Aristotle. And as the late night sage television host Craig Ferguson says, I look forward to your letters. Have a safe weekend and thank you for your attention today. I think you did under 10 minutes. <laughs> that was about 12. Good. That's why they love me. <laughs> exactly. Thank you.